I'm on a hunt. No. Not a hunt for any animal or game. Not something much more elusive. I am hunting for perfection. Hunting for that old, trusted woods companion. The perfect outdoors blade. A knife that I'd never want to leave behind. What makes a perfect knife? What does it look like? In truth, the aesthetics of this knife aren't going to be anything spectacular. The knife design really hasn't changed that much in a few hundred years, so why is this one any different? You see, I have been a knife fanatic since I was five years old. I still remember my first knife. Since then, I've had hundreds of knives come and go. Some good, some great, and some that were truly horrible. Once I started making my own knives, I really started to look at what details make a knife look cool versus what designs actually aid in performance. They say the devil's in the details, and that holds true here. My perfect knife is a culmination of all my best attributes of the past knives. Each one a small part, but when combined, make for a knife that was built for performance above all else. Efficiency and ergonomics are paramount. This isn't a knife built to win any beauty contests. No, it's a working man's play. There aren't any extraneous parts to get in the way. It's light, agile, balanced. It's got a thin enough blade to cut like a laser, and it's thick enough to have complete confidence. This blade is just at home skinning a deer as it is prepping food or building a fire. The handle on this knife is designed to be used all day. It provides excellent grip and protection. You'll never fatigue from any hot spots, no matter how it's being used. This knife cuts when you need it, and it disappears when you don't. I found my perfect outdoor knife. Now it's time to go make it a reality. This video is going to be a little bit different from my others. I'm going to focus less on the build process and more on the design. All the little details that make this knife an absolute performer. I'm going to the shop and I'm going to show you exactly what I'm talking about. We're here in the shop, and this here is my big book of knife designs. Now there are a lot of great ones in here. Each one kind of fills a specific task, a specific need. Um, there are some chef's knives, some historical knives, some knives that are just meant to look really awesome. But one knife to me really stands out. It stands out because it's the perfect outdoor blade. For me. Now I know that perfection can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people, but for me and for what I need out of a knife, this next design really fits the bill. So in general, I find elegance in simplicity. Now I am not an artist by any means, so bear with <laughs> poor drawings. Um, I enjoy when form follows function, and this knife, this next knife design really falls with that philosophy. There are no extraneous features. I'm not trying to win any beauty contests or mimic any historical blades. It's simply my idea of efficiency personified. So when starting with a design like this, you really need to ask yourself, what does this knife aim to do? What is the purpose of the knife? You can see here, chef's knife. This knife is meant for food prep and it did it really really well. I have both these knives, they work beautifully. Now this next one is going to be an outdoors knife for me. It's not a pocket knife, it's not some huge fighting knife, it's not some historical blade. It's something that's going to come with me while I'm hunting, while I'm camping, fishing, hiking, dirt biking, on the quad, and all the things I love to do outdoors. So I've got to ask myself, what are going to be the main purposes of this knife what are the tasks I want this next knife to accomplish? And that's a big question. It's kind of where your key design elements come into play. You see, the perfect chef's knife would be awful at skinning a deer, and just as the best skinning knife would make a less than ideal carving knife or chef's knife, and so on and so on. See, this design needs to be like the Kawasaki KLR of the knife world. Maybe not the best at any one task, but completely confident in anything it comes up against. 
So I use my blade primarily for opening packages, skinning large and small game, prepping food is a big one, gutting fish another big one, making a fire, occasional wood carving. So a thick blade is not ideal really for any of those tasks. So I'm going to be on the thinnish side of stock, which in this instance I'm using 1 8 inch. I really like 8 inch stock. It makes for a good, light, and strong blade. Uh, it's also, um, because I want it to be lightweight and a handy knife, I'm aiming for essentially the smallest blade that can confidently accomplish anything it goes up against. So I don't want some big 6, 8 inch blade because that generally just more gets in the way, if anything. Alright, we've got to be coming up here soon. Where is it at? I've made the Raspy Hunter. That's a sweet knife. Pretty good one. Really good one, actually. We're getting there. Cool fighting knife. Not what I'm after. This was kind of one of my first conceptual ideas. It has a lot of the elements that I like. Some elements I don't like. A little Randall copy. Let's see what else. This here, the classic drop point hunter. This one, it comes really, really close to being a perfect knife. It really does. For me, it's got a lot of the stuff I like in a knife, but I can make improvements upon this. Something to fit me better than what this can fulfill. Getting close. This is a hidden tang knife. I love hidden tang knives. They're gorgeous. But for this design, for what I'm after, full tang is where it needs to be. This is the last knife I made, and this was kind of the first aha moment for me in this handle design. So you see, I thought I was going to like this one, this handle better. But when I grabbed this handle right here, absolutely fell in love. It is, it's dang near perfect. Now, finger choil, no. Here it is! <laughs> now, remember, you're not going to be blown away by the design cues. Remember, this is supposed to impress the hand, not necessarily the eye. Not that it's going to be an ugly knife, but it's not going to be one of those knives you look at and say, oh my gosh, that's cool, because that's not its goal, it's not its aim. Its aim is not to look like a wall hanger, some fantasy knife. Now, this is supposed to be a user's knife, an outdoorsman's knife. That's exactly what it's going to accomplish. Now, let's get into the nitty gritty here of the knife design, kind of exactly what I'm thinking behind all the processes. So this is a five inch blade and a five inch blade with a straight spine. I find that this is just what is perfect for my hand. It's perfectly balanced. After years of using and making a lot of knives, I found that a straight spine is preferred over any sort of thumb indentation, any sort of harpoon, any sort of can't forward or recurve. No, no, no. See, all those do is after hard use, they just create hot spots. You see, if you've got your thumb on here and anything but a straight spine, what happens is as you're using it, you get a hot spot here and on the base and on the tip and on the base, and it just starts to give you blisters. I don't think that that many people actually use their knives for extended period of time because you don't find these things out until you've spent an hour with this thing in your hand, and you'll find after a little bit of use exactly what works and what really just doesn't work. But see, this is the first knife I actually drew, but I had to make some changes. Namely, the clip point. Ah, I love a clip point. They are beautiful. Classic. Reminiscent of that Bowie-style blade. The problem, the big drawback the clip point has, and this isn't a very severe clip point, so I could probably get away with it and really not have any issue. However, if I'm going for perfection here, they, all they do is they remove material behind tip. It's a less supported tip. For no other reason. You don't actually gain any sort of performance except potentially stabbing. But since I don't really plan on having this as a fighting knife, I'm not going to have a lot of stabbing going on. So the drop point gives you more metal behind the tip, a stronger knife design. And if you'll notice the tip position, now this is another big one. So you too far forward, you lose all your belly. This is where you're gonna be, this is the bread and butter of your knife right here. This is what you're gonna be using a lot of the times is this belly. Too far forward, you'll lose the belly. And if you want more belly, you bring this tip more towards the spine. However, you'll find that when you have the knife in hand, you've really gotta cant your wrist forward to gain access 
to that tip and use it efficiently. Now nah, this is a good one. It's almost centered by a slightly to the spine. And this is something in the final, when I've actually got the profile of the knife in hand, I'll put it down on the table, pretend like I'm using it, and I can kind of shift the position of this without losing too much, you know, losing an eighth of an inch or so, without losing too much length of the blade, I can really play around with the tip position. Let me take a look at the grind. You'll notice that this is not a full flat, it is a saber grind. This is my preferred grind right here, a high saber grind. Scandi grinds are great, but in one area in particular that I really need this knife for, I feel like the Scandi knife falls short. And that's in food prep. So you'll notice a chef's knife, it's a full flat grind, the majority of them. That's because a full flat grind has the least amount of material, it's a very shallow angle behind the edge. And what that does is let it just slide through any material you're cutting. The problem was, is that for a harder to use knife, and I want to be confident in this knife completely. The problem with a full flat is that with that thinner angle, you get less material behind the edge, giving you a weaker edge overall. So this is a nice compromise right here between strength and cutting ability is this high saber. That's what I really like in my knives. Moving down, we get to the guard. Now, I love a full guard. A full tang, full guard knife, that's kind of, you don't see that very often. I have a few designs in here actually that are full tang, full guard knife. Full guards are gorgeous. They're, they're regal in a way. Um, but unless you plan on getting out into a knife fight, which I have no intentions of ever doing, they're just more hindrance than help, and that's that's all I really can say about that. You can't get your thumb behind there, you can't change your grip, because that guard is just in the way. And since you're not going to be blocking any knives, <laughs> it's just, it's not needed, it's not needed at all. You see this small half guard is absolutely perfect for me. It provides excellent measure of safety, you're not going to ride past that and hit the blade. And it gives your hand something to index on when you're not looking directly at the blade. So when you go to re-hole straight out of the sheath, you can slide your hand down, hit the half guard, pull it out. Also, if this knife is in a game, which has happened, if you're in the carcass, you're not actually looking at the blade. You have no way of getting your hand onto the actual blade itself because that guard is providing all the protection you'd ever need. You'll also notice that this guard I don't know if you will with my drawings. Again, not the best. Knives, really good drawings, not so much. Anyways, you'll notice that this knife, this guard here, is devoid of a bolster or any handle material on here. It's just part of the bar stock. That is perfect. And what that does is while I love a bolster, especially a nickel silver bolster or even a brass bolster, they're gorgeous, they're timeless, but they add a lot of weight. And they don't give you anything in return for all that added weight. This is where it's at. It gives you just enough protection and the weight savings, being without a bolster, key. The last thing you'll notice about this guard is that it's very shallow. It is not very wide in the least bit. And what that does is it allows this cutting edge to be very close to your index finger. You see, as you start to work away from your index finger and you start to work with the knife, you lose precision, you lose strength, and as you come closer and closer to your hand, you gain all that back, and so you do not want a big space, and that's kind of my biggest pet peeve with finger choils, is that unless you're using the finger choil, you have limited control with your knife compared to a knife like this that just has a well-executed grip and no finger choil. Finally, that comes with probably my favorite part of this knife design, and that is the grip. You see, a big pet peeve of mine in knife designs, and so many people I feel like get this wrong, is they have a knife handle with these huge finger indentations, wraparound grips, molded grips, secondary guards that come through your fingers. Those can be really comfortable in one grip. As soon as you move your hand away from that grip, those finger choils, those finger indentations, they don't move with you at all. And it only can create hot spots. It forces you to be in that grip, even if you don't want to be, even if the task requires you to change your grip. 
Finger grooves don't work. You'll never see somebody, a butcher, who uses a knife all day, use a knife with really pronounced finger grooves. Now they can look really cool, don't get me wrong, they can look really comfortable, but if you actually use your knife for any extended period of time, finger grooves only get in the way. Now, with that said, <laughs> I do have a slight finger groove here. This finger groove is really shallow and it provides some interesting features. First of all, is it reduces this cross section right here, giving you the ability to really lock in on a pinch grip and kind of removes the necessity of a finger choil because it just lets you lock in and you can use all this blade right here with confidence. It also extends this section right here of the guard, eliminating the need to extend your guard to get the same amount of coverage. And while I said that as you move away from one grip, that you can create hot spots, this grip doesn't. This single shallow finger choil for your, or finger indentation for your index finger, it creates this little tiny hump right here, this little protrusion. It's not enough to be a hot spot, even after hours of use. You can move around all over this grip and it doesn't get uncomfortable ever. As you move down the grip, you'll notice that it sweeps forward, sweeps away from the spine, both at the rear of the handle and at the front. And here's what that does. It's a really key, important thing that a lot of knives don't have or they have way too much of. You have to get this just right. You see, if you have a perfectly straight handle and you grip it, the angle of the knife in relation to your grip is at 90. What this does is it removes material from the bottom so it gets pushed forward and then it creates material here for your pinky to push against and it creates an oblique angle. What this does is as you use the knife on a flat surface it can remove your knuckles out of the way and in my opinion it gives you a more natural point and more natural ergonomic way to use the knife as opposed to a straight 90. Now you don't want too much because then using this section down here is hard and at some point if you have too much angle, it's too oblique, then it's, you have the same problem where your knuckles aren't in the, out of the way, they're still in the way and it's flat again. So this is the perfect amount to get that angle just right where it's comfortable for food prep, it's not straight up at 90 and it's not too far forward. It's a big key aspect in the design of a knife that can really make or break the usability, the functionality of the blade. And at the very heel here, I have a spot for our lanyard. I'm not entirely sure if I want to do a recess like this of the actual wood material, or if I'm just going to put a, a tube through the wood. I do like a lanyard in some instances, but also in some instances it can get in the way. So I'm, I'm planning on putting a paracord lanyard on for the beginning. Uh, because I do like having some cord out in the in the woods. It can be really handy, but if it ever gets in the way, it'll be easy enough to take off. Anyways, there we have it. All the features <laughs> of all the knives that I really like culminated into one perfect outdoors knife for me. Let's go make some sparks. <laughs>